Um, so I'm a former New York Times intern. I'm originally from Puerto Rico, um, and I've been in New York for about five years. I'm based here. Um, so I work for editorial clients. Um, I do NGO work. I do commercial work. So I do a little bit of everything. Um, but what I'm going to be showing you guys today um, is sort of a progression of work. So um, starting with work I did for the Times in Washington, D.C., covering politics since we're in 2006, uh, we're leading up to the 2016 elections. And then also some of my more recent body of work um, abroad. Um, so I'll just jump right in. And if you guys have any questions or you know want to talk about anything, um, feel free to interrupt, um, and I'll repeat the question out. Um, so this this first body of work is work that I did in Washington D.C. covering the White House and Congress for uh, for the New York Times. And so with the cycle of politics, I sort of try to get away from sort of the facade and the presentation of it because everything is very constructed. Everything is, a, you know, is sort of like for the photo op. Um, and so I like really became obsessed with the construction of the theater of politics, if you will. Um, so this is a series that I did. This is the, the State of the Union address in 2013. Um, that's Obama. This is on Valentine's Day. Um, so really sort of doing like, a, like an unconventional look at the political life in DC um, and sort of the archetypes and the myths that sort of repeat themselves. And so this project is called Palimpsest, which is um, a papyrus that it was written on and then sort of scraped to be written on again. And so traces of the previous writing remains. And so it's sort of a, uh, a comparison to politics and how like the same conversations happen over and over again. Um, through sort of these archetypal myths and conversations that happen in American politics. This is pretty funny. You can't use anything electronic on the, on the, on the floor of the Senate or the House, so everybody sort of has these quivers of, of poster boards that they use. I don't know if that's big enough, but it says medium, medium eagle with spread wings made in China. It's pretty funny. It's $150 bills shredded. This is the inside of the press gallery of Air Force One. The White House. This is right after Trayvon Martin was, um, was killed. And so it was, I thought it was really interesting that you know, sort of the response of lawmakers was to throw up this banner it said, and racial profiling and just talk about it, which seems wildly inaccu inaccu inadequate, like, given what's happened in the recent, in recent years since then. This is the sofa in the Oval Office. This is during a meeting with the president and the president of Yemen. This is when Wendy Davis announced that she might be running for senator, governor of Texas. This is President Obama's signature. And this is the, the podium right before Obama spoke for the first time about the NSA. Um, so that's that. Um, if anybody has any particular questions, raise your hand. If not, I'll keep going. Um, the, so this body of work is, was made in Mexico. Um, right after the 43 students disappeared um, last September, um, and if, for those who don't know, it was basically a group of 43 students who had gone to Iguala, to one of the major towns in Guerrero, Mexico, which is a state just south uh, west of the capital, about two hours out of the capital. Um, and they had gone to sort of protest and commandeer a bus. And the, the governor of the town, the mayor of the town, sort of ordered them, um, ordered the police to take care of them. And what the police did was they they opened fire on the bus um, and rounded 43 of them, um, and they've never been seen since. Um, through interrogation, the, the authorities are sort of, like the official story is that the police handed over the 43 students to the cartel, which then um, killed them. And in the aftermath of that, um, the townspeople of Iguala, who had been sort of under the reign of terror of the cartels, um, sort of sought like saw an opportunity to, to go out into the territory that belonged to the cartels and look for people who had been disappearing over the years. So when we got there, we sort of went to do a story about the 43 students, but realized that for the last six or 10 years, um, hundreds of people had disappeared in this town alone. 
when the official numbers of disappearances in the entire state of Guerrero were only about 120 for that year, um, in this town there were about five to 600 people who were reporting missing over six years, um, including the 43 students. Um, so, so this is basically a photo essay about the townspeople going out into the hills and sort of reclaiming and looking for their loved ones, dead or alive. Um, and they found, I think, a couple dozen mass graves. Um, the first one, which contained 26 people. Um, and that's that grave. And then this is the road to the dump of Kokula, which is a, a neighboring town, which is where um, the only evidence of the 43 students has been found is a small shard of, of bone um, that, was, that was DNA sampled and found to, be, to belong to one of the students. Yeah. And what was pretty eerie about doing this story is that we would sort of hike up into the hills um, and they were littered with, with belongings of people. I mean, these are, this is very remote farmland and the farmers work the land and they're not you know, littering or, or leaving trash everywhere. So when you encounter these objects, they're sort of the residue of these sort of horrible acts that had happened in these hills. Um, these were belongings of people that were either being kidnapped or were working for the cartels. Um, the bottom one, the bottom right, was a, a pile of clothing that was found right next to, the, to that first mass grave. So it's presumed belongings of the, of the 26 people that were buried there. And this is sort of the landscape. So his wife was disappeared about a year ago now, um, last June. Um, and he basically moved farther up into the hills because he was afraid that him and his two children were, were going to be next. Um, and a lot of women um, and children who are kidnapped are often either used um, in the drug trade as, um, as indentured servants or um, trafficked um, into the sex trade, especially for women. And this is a picture of the mayor who, who ordered the attack, who's now in, in police custody. This is Miguel. He actually was just found murdered uh, about two weeks ago um, in the taxi that he drove. And he was a member of the UPOEG, which was a, a sort of community policing group that, of people that banded together in their towns to defend their, their towns against the cartel. Because the level of violence was so strong that they figured you know, they might as well take up arms and, and die in a shootout with the cartel than, than just be subject to the tyranny of the cartel. Uh, and that happened um, in Guerrero with his organization and then in Michoacan, which is the neighboring state. Um, and if you guys haven't gone and seen a documentary called Cartel Land, I highly recommend it. Which delves straight, like, really into that, into that, um, those community policing organizations. And this is one of the searchers. Yeah, absolutely. So the federal government, um, the federal government opened uh, a series of official investigations. The problem is, is and this, is, it, this repeats itself with Mexico, and it's repeating itself now with the, with the case of Ruben Espinosa, who is a photojournalist who was killed in DF, in, in the city. Um, the federal government, the, so in my opinion, there's a few layers, right? The federal government is pretty ill-equipped to, to conduct these investigations. Um, or if they are very equipped, they don't seem like they're, that they really care. But there's also another thing. I mean, the cartel and, and, and the government on every level are intrinsically linked. So there's no incentive for the federal government to investigate this and reveal sort of a wide pattern of corruption and collusion. Um, and th what's interesting about this, these 43 students, which was sort of like the beginning of this whole thing, was that it showed in a very public way um, how the government and the cartels were being linked. I mean, literally, the community police, it's almost like saying the NYPD handed over these 43 students to criminals, to the cartels, you know, to mafiosos, who then disappeared them. And so to investigate that link is incredibly um, sort of, you know, not very, it's not very convenient for the government, if you will. Um, but they're on the ground. I mean, a lot of, like, so... A few of these pictures, um, let's see. 
So this site, this first grave, was investigated by, by the federal government. And I think only about two or three people have been identified out of this grave. Um, so the work is very slow. And, and while they are present, um, there's just no results, really. And no faith in the government, either. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, yeah, any more questions about Mexico before I move on? No? OK. Um, so this is uh, probably my most recent body of work um, in the Dominican Republic. So in 2013, the Dominican Supreme Court basically um, issued a ruling that said that anybody who could not trace, it's, this is, it's very like legal, but anybody who couldn't trace their ancestry back to before 1929 in the Dominican Republic um, could face losing, being stripped of their citizenship. And in practice, what this sort of ruling um, did was it left um, close to a quarter of uh, half a million people stateless or without citizenship, and then about a quarter of a million of those people were completely stateless. Um, the, the law is really aimed at purging the Dominican Republic from Haitians. Um, a lot of the Haitians were brought as migrant laborers by big corporations in the DR and by the, DR, the Dominican government. Um, and since like basically the 30s and 40s, they've created these communities within the DR and have lived for generations there. So um, a lot of the people that are, that are now stateless are, are kids who, who can trace their ancestry two or three generations before them in the DR. So for all intents and purposes, they're Dominican. Um, this particular picture was the, the day, the, the end of the registration period that the government sort of allowed um, anybody to sign up and, and they could apply for citizenship. The problem with this, what they were calling the regularization process, was that they needed to present eight documents. The requirements of the of like the requirements of that law was was very specifically targeted at the Haitian community. I mean, it was birth certificates, it was um, notarized um, sort of documentation of of bank accounts and property ownership. Many of which, since since the, the Haitian community in the DR has been living on sort of unincorporated hamlets um, close to what used to be the sugarcane fields, um, it's very difficult for them to have access to these to these documents. And so this was um, in June. So this was the, the mid-June. Mid and when I was there, um, I met people like Sanu, who's 23. Um, he, he was born in the Dominican Republic. His parents were born in the Dominican Republic. And he speaks Spanish. Um, he's never been to Haiti. And this picture was taken just across the border um, where there are now encampments forming sort of tent cities um, and refu refuge areas for people who are just being dropped at the border. Um, and so what you have at the border is now what I think is increasingly a humanitarian crisis of people who aren't welcome in the DR and were often, in his case, violently um, deported. And then people who, who aren't, don't belong in the Dominican Republic but also aren't Haitian. They've never been to Haiti. They'd have no family in Haiti. As as well as Junior. Junior is, is younger than Sano. He's 23, and I think Junior was like 13. Hey, uh, Chris. Yeah? Um, we have a, a question from the internet about your lens usage. Yeah, totally. Could you just let uh, me Yeah, yeah. So just to get that one out of the way, um, I use a Canon. I use a 6D and a 5D Mark II. I, use a, I almost exclusively use a 35 and a 50. Um, sometimes I shoot with 7200. Um, but yeah, 50, 35, all prime. A lot of it is lit. Um, I use a handheld flash. Um, that's pretty much it. Was there another question around here? Which border uh, crossing were, the, were, were those taken Was at? this particularly? Yes. Um, this was in Himani. Um, Himani has a school on the other side, which is where Sana was, was uh, photographed, um, where they've taken a few classrooms and turned them into a refuge. I mean, they're tiny classrooms, and there's like 30 or 40 um, sort of deportees there. Um, in Pedernales, which is down south, there's like full-blown tent cities. I mean, those tent cities existed before um, from um, victims of the, earth the earthquake, um, but more people have been added to it because of this, because of this law. And then there's also a lot of Haitians who are self-deporting because the discrimination and the, and the violence against the Haitian community is so powerful um, that a lot of them have just left willingly. And I photographed a few of them as well. 
So this is them getting photographed for the regularization process. Um, and these are the documents that they've been collecting of people trying to register, which goes to show how much importance they're really giving to it. Um, this is a little girl in, in one of the batellas. In, with the batellas are the, are the, are the sugarcane communities um, where a lot of the Haitian immigrants have sort of settled. Um, and these are hecklers who are saying, you know, get out of my country. It was a lot more profane than that, but yeah. And these are the batellas. So the access to, you know, to education, the access to government, the access to being able to register um, even when you're born for a birth certificate, um, is very difficult. I mean, we, this is a full-blown community with like a little grocery store and everything, um, but they're very far out. I mean, they're in the city, but it's like dirt roads, and they're very isolated from the rest of it. Um, so for the regularization process, for the deadline, people had been waiting and sleeping out on the streets for anywhere from three to six days. Um, this man had been there for three days. And so... For the people who have not been deported, um, you know, this is sort of the face of, of somebody who's 18, who never registered with the government, has lived his entire life in the Dominican Republic, but if um, immigration officials or the police or just a mob of sort of nationalists come into his, to his um, community, he's the first to go. And that's sort of what it looks like. I mean, a lot of people, um, sort of angry mobs with machetes, just roll into these towns and start looking at people, and if you can't produce uh, cédula, which is a you know a, an official government ID card. That's it. Get in the truck, and we'll drop you off at the border, or we'll hand you over to the government, who will then uh, deport you. And so when Sanu got to the school, um, his sister had disappeared um, in December. So this was June. So his sister had been disappeared, had had been taken from his village, you know, six months before. Um, and when he got to the school, he found his sister there um, who had been deported in December and had been living here with nowhere to go. Um, so it was a sort of a bittersweet reunion. Um, and this, you know, I mean, it's a little baby and he grew up in the Dominican Republic and his parents are both Dominican. So it sort of begs the question of like, what happens when you turn back the clock? And then this is the Massacre River, which is where Trujillo in the 1930s um, killed 20,000 Haitians. So. You know, the relationship between the Haitians and the Dominican are, are very, um, have very deep roots, um, and it's one of a lot of violence and aggression. This is a woman who was repeatedly trying to cross, and the, the guards just sort of weren't having it. But, you know, another big part of this thing is that, is that the, the, the borders are so porous that it's almost impossible to really control the flow of people and to really sort of clamp down on immigration, especially when you know, the Dominican Republic, its second, um, is the largest exporter of goods um, to Haiti. So its second largest importer of Dominican goods after the US is Haiti. Um, and what happens at these border crossings is that they open the gates and people can move freely back and forth for a market um, to buy goods. Um, a lot of goods which aren't, are, people aren't able to get in, in Haiti. This is one of the scenes from those markets. And this is, this is what the border looks like. I mean, this is right behind sort of the school, and a lot of the people who have been seeking refuge in the school are fishing in this lake for sustenance. And so this family um, is one of the self-deportees. So they had sort of, they had lived in the DR for about 13 years, um, and the violence was so bad and the discrimination was so bad that they just decided to leave on their own. This man had been waiting for three days as well in the line, and he you know, passed the time reading a, a Bible. Can I ask a question? Yeah? So like, what happens when they are deported? Does Haiti welcome them back, or is there? What happens when they do get deported? Does Haiti welcome them back, or how does the situation play out? No, so, um, so it's really complicated. Martelli has sort of, um, at least when we were there, was sort of remaining quiet, but he had sort of offhandedly said, you know, they're not Haitian, we don't want them. Um, but the Haitian um, citizenship law is actually really, comp is really unique in the fact that, for example, if you are born to a Haitian parent or two Haitian parents in New York City, you are Haitian, because it's by blood. It's not by where you were born or sort of legal status. It's, it's, it's by blood. So, um, but you can have dual citizenship. So if you were born in the DR, for example, 
um, under American law, you would be Dominican, and under Dominican law, you were Dominican because you were born in the Dominican Republic, but um, you couldn't, you were also Haitian, but you couldn't apply for Haitian citizenship because you have to pick one or the other. Um, is it? So what's, so what's the, the distinction? Oh, really? It wasn't the case before, though, right? Okay. Oh, okay. From the American side. Yeah. You can. Do you know if it works for the DR? Like, if you were a Dominican citizen, could... Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's okay. But that's, that's a good distinction. So the distinction was that if you are from U the U.S. or Canada, you can have dual citizenship, um, which is useful. Um, but if you're Dominican, then I, 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 it's my understanding, at least, that you can. But, um, yeah, and so, so that, to answer your question, um, no. You know, I, 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 what's up? This particular, this is the Dahawong Crossing in sort of the, the northern part of the country of the Dominican Republic. So these are Haitians crossing into the Dominican Republic for market, um, and most of them go back home. Yeah. So if, if Haiti isn't wel welcoming them back, where are they going? They're just, they're just living illegally in Haiti. Oh. Yeah, I mean, they're, so, so yeah, so they just, they get dropped off at the border and they cross, and then they live in one of these refuge. Sorry. If they have um, family in, in Haiti, then a lot of them will go back to those, to those towns. So some of the self-deportees aren't Dominican citizens and they don't qualify for Dominican citizenship. I mean, it is also important to note that not everybody is stateless. Um, a lot of people are, are illegal sort of like, you know, illegal residents in the Dominican Republic who came to work. They're migrant workers. And so um, they don't have any legal recourse to stay in the DR. Um, and a lot of those people are sort of going back because they're mostly recent arrivals. Um, so it's a mixed bag. So there's people who, you know, who don't have any legal recourse to stay in the DR and go back. Um, and then there's people who are being forced back um, when they've never been to Haiti. And so what happens is there's just, a, when I was there, there were just a few sort of refuges of people that were just clumping around these little towns and living there, um, trying to figure out the next step. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Were you, were you on assignment for this? Yeah. A, 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 with whom? With Vice News. And what language were you communicating with the people if you were? Mostly in Spanish. Um, and we had, a, we had a, a fixer who spoke Creole, Spanish, and English. Um, I speak Spanish. Um, so with most of them, and especially a lot of the kids who are stateless, who, who grew up in the Dominican Republic, they speak very fluent Spanish, as well as Creole. So, so I was mostly operating in Spanish. Um, but for the, for the instances where we had to speak Creole, we had a fixer. Um, how long have you been working for Vice News? And, and is that, I mean, it, this was my first assignment, actually. And was it your last, or have you been working um, for them I've since? done a couple of assignments for them since. Um, I think they're starting to sort of um, delve into assigning photographers and doing some more long form stuff. I went with a TV crew or with a video crew um, down to, to do this story. So we worked with an on camera person and a, and a videographer. Did people know who Vice was, were? Some did, but most, most of them didn't. Yeah. And this is, this is the, one of the self-deportees as well. And so see, these are the, these are the birth certificates. And it, do, it, it sort of, it, it highlights, you know, who, where you're, you're the, the descendants of your parents and all that kind of stuff. So with this documentation, um, you would not be Dominican under the new law. Sorry? Was that a hate? It was, uh, it was the kid who was like one or two years old, um, and it's his birth certificate of being born in the Dominican Republic. Um, yeah. To, ha to parents of Haitian descent. Yeah. And then um, this is the last thing I'll show, which is sort of an ongoing project about um, one of the longest surveillance programs ever conducted by the U.S. government um, on its own citizens. And so um, this took place in Puerto Rico from about the 1930s uh, to 1988. Um, and it was, a, it was a program by which a sort of a, a secret police, if you will, sort of imagine the Stasi on a little bit of a lesser scale, 
um, was created um, to physically, um, telephonically um, surveil anybody associated with the pro-independence movement or any movement of the left, um, anybody deemed subversive. And what ended up happening was um, a compilation of close to a quarter of a million files um, on people who many of them had never even violated the law. So it's really a, a story about a violation of privacy, but also um, the effect of surveillance. You know, I think I, the, the genesis of it for me was that I was saying, oh, well, you know, if the NSA is, is surveilling me, who cares? You know, they can read my emails. But it's not really the content of the surveillance that matters. It's the effect that it can have. And in Puerto Rico, I think that this program really thwarted any political discussion and did not give um, Puerto Rico a fair chance at self-determination because the intimidation and the surveillance was so widespread that even if you, you know, would have a conversation with somebody who talked about pro-independence, that could have triggered um, a file being opened on you. Um, this is Bupa. So she, this is a mugshot from when um, a bomb was detonated in her pharmacy, um, presumably by an operative of the, of the police, um, and she was framed for it. Um, she never got convicted because there was insufficient evidence. This is Silen. He's the founder of the, the Federation of uh, Pro-Independent Students. Um, and he was surveilled for 30 years. And he, had, he would often say that in his classroom in the university, there was undercover agents who were, who were there to sort of monitor what he was saying. These are letters written from prison. And then this is sort of very typical. It's, um, it's a list of everybody who attended the funeral um, and burial of um, Chagi Mari, who was the son of one of the leading um, pro-independence leaders of the early 1970s, um, who was assassinated by somebody who identified as a member of the Cuban right. So after the Cuban Revolution, a lot of the people that moved to Puerto Rico um, were sort of the wealthy and were the very sort of right wing um, of, of, the, of the Cuban sort of social strata. And they were diametrically opposed to the left that was just sort of gaining momentum in Puerto Rico. And so Henry Goida um, killed Chagi um, at, to get to his father. And this is the name of everybody who it's assisted. It's double paged. But the, the numbers right next to the names are the numbers of the files. So it just gives you a scope of you know, whoever was there taking down names um, was, was corroborating it with files. That's the, the burial site. Rafaelito. So this is one of the earliest artifacts that I found. Um, this is from 1947. It was a, a peaceful march um, in, in support of, of the independence movement. And then, yeah, the guy in the, in the, in the front is um, Rafael Casal Miranda, and to the right is Eriuel Tomarin, both who I photographed for this project. Um, this belonged to a photojournalist of one of the, the leading sort of uh, national papers who was surveilled um, pretty extensively. Those are pupas. Um, and then this is the last file. Um, I think that's it. Um, is there any questions about that? Technique? Any questions? No? All right. Well, awesome. thank you so much. Thank Chris you, guys. Curry. Give it up for him. Oh, wait, we do have a question? No? Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Are you, are you thinking in, uh, in a work in those, um, your photographer work in a sense of creating an exhibition? Uh, for which body of work? Um, I mean... For any of it? L yeah, looking that... From yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I, I work primarily as an editorial photographer for, for clients, so for magazines, newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, but my, my passion really lies in, in sort of doing that and getting the story out that way, but also sort of making books and making exhibitions and making things that people can really spend time with and engage with. So this, bo this last body of work is part of a, a larger body of work um, in Puerto Rico um, that I'm hoping to make over the next two years and publish a book from and probably subsequently an exhibition. This body of work will probably end up in an exhibition installed publicly in Puerto Rico because it's sort of an issue that 
you know, is a wound that people haven't really dealt with. I mean, a lot of the people that did the surveilling and a lot of people that were surveilled are still alive and living together. So hopefully, you know, doing sort of a public intervention or even having a big gallery showing could be interesting socially to have people interact. And one thing that I actually didn't mention is that when these w were made public by, by sort of a whistleblower in 88, um, the, the files were literally handed back to people. So you would get a letter in the mail and they'd say, well, we've been watching you for 40 years. Come pick up your file. And you'd pick it up and you would go through it and you would find out that your neighbor, that your spouse, that your cousins were all informing on you for money. So everybody was sort of informing on each other to sort of save their skin. Um, so the wounds are very deep and a lot of people are still really grappling with the reality of having been betrayed um, under the guise of, of these, you know, of the government. And it's also fair to mention that these are only the Puerto Rican police documents. Um, there's a trove, almost for every single file, there's a corresponding FBI file um, that are in English, but they haven't really been, been released to the public. Um, you can FOIA them, but it's very difficult to get a hold of them because you don't know which files exist where, and if you've ever FOIAed anything, you know that's incredibly difficult anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much. 